lecture or this presentation is going to be about human immunodeficiency virus, so HIV. I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. Um, HIV first started hitting the scene around 1986, 1987. This is at the time I was graduating from nursing school. It was a big deal back then. We didn't know what was going on. Um, I saw a lot of young men die. It was very sad. Um, different times. I'm glad we've had better medication, be better education now. Um, so it's become a chronic illness. Um, of course, they can still have long-term consequences. All right, so let's talk about recognizing cues, so the signs and symptoms. So firstly, somebody gets infected. An infection is transferred through blood or body fluids. So two to four weeks after this transmission of fluid happens, okay, the patient's going to come down with like flu symptoms. And some people um, don't recognize this as HIV because they forget what they did, you know, a couple weeks ago. So the patient's going to have a fever, they'll have night sweats, they'll have muscle um, soreness, um, maybe joint pain, you know, like, you know how you feel when you have the flu, right? That's how they're going to feel. Sore throat, rash. Now this resolves, the symptoms resolve, and then everybody with HIV usually has lymph adenopathy, and that means swollen lymph nodes, okay? And for the next 10 years or so, the patient will be asymptomatic. Okay, and we're trying to, you know, hopefully they won't come down with AIDS because, you know, if a patient gets AIDS and it's unmedicated, they're going to probably die in five years. Um, so we want to do a lot of good education, which I'll talk about later. Now, if they develop uh, AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency virus, they're going to be at risk for opportuni opportunistic infections, or I should say, we know they have AIDS when they start getting opportunistic infections, okay, and their CD4 level is below 200. So that's how we know that HIV has progressed to AIDS. Everyone with AIDS has HIV, but everybody with HIV does not have AIDS, okay? So again, the pathophysiology involves the virus being transmitted through infected blood and body fluids. The body fluids we're talking about is semen and vaginal fluids in blood, of course. Um, now, there are a lot of other bloody uh, body fluids that HIV is contained in, but the disease has done, is not transmitted through those body fluids. It's through usually semen and vaginal fluids, okay? So when it's hatched, attaches to the CD4s and the T lymphocytes, and it's found, I told you, in other body fluids. Risk factors include having unprotected sex. And let me tell you something, people my age, older adults, um, they came of age, let me say it like this, at a time when we didn't worry about HIV, okay? So protected sex was not really happening back before HIV came on the scene, put it that way. And also in older adults, especially females that are postmenopausal, they have vaginal dryness. So when they have unprotected sex, they, they're, they're gonna be more at risk because um, the unprotected sex is gonna result in micro sores on the, um, so in other words, there's gonna be breaking of skin on the vaginal walls, okay? And that, that could lead to the virus getting in easier. Okay, so perinatal exposure is also a risk factor, so mom to baby. Healthcare workers can be at risk if they're not careful. Um, and people who engage in IV drug use, those are all risk factors. The complications, or I should say the opportunistic infections. So they can get like thrush, you know, that's a yeast infection in the mouth. They can get like herpes in their mouth. Um, I've seen really bad cases of herpes in the mouth. Um, bacterial, they can get tuberculosis. Now we're gonna talk about tuberculosis later in the semester. Um, they can get sepsis, so they have sepsis shock. That's, you're gonna worry about them getting an infection and then getting septic, okay? Viral infections, I took care of a lot of men back in the 80s who had CMV, cytomegalovirus, 
uh, it's a type of virus, and it, it was in their brain. Like, it would make them encephalopic. They would get um, very confused. Herpes zoster, this is a varicella virus, and it results in burning pain with a rash on one side of the body. And they also can get something called pneumocystis pneumonia, um, and that was common. I saw a lot of patients with that condition back in the day. Um, and then there's also HIV-related uh, malignancies, Kaposi sarcoma. You, I got a picture of that I'm going to show you, but it's, it happens um, in people with HIV. And um, they get red and purple lesions on the skin or inside their mouth. If you Google it, you can see some of those. And then wasting syndrome. Okay, so wasting syndrome can happen. It, it's, it results in unintentional weight loss, which is something we all dream of, but it's not very healthy to have unintentional weight loss. Usually it's 10 pounds or more. They're going to be at high risk for malnutrition. They'll have diarrhea, fat intolerance in mouth sores, anorexia. Okay, so that's, you know, you want to try to make sure you can keep up their nutrition. All right, the diagnostic studies. First of all, all pregnant women need to be screened for HIV. Um, it, HIV is going to result in pancytopenia. Remember, we talked about that in the cancer lecture. They're going to have anemia, neutropenia, so you're going to have to do all those neutropenia precautions, and anemia and thrombocytopenia, okay? So at risk for bleeding, anemia, they're going to be short of breath, tired, fatigued. You're going to have to alternate periods of rest with activity, okay? And, of course, HIV positive. A lot of different tests they can do, the Western blot, the ELSA test, um, a lot of different tests, okay? Monitor the LFTs when they're on the antiviral medication because it can be damaging to the liver, and then monitor the CD4 to CD8 ratio. All right, you're going to also be, if you have somebody in the hospital with HIV, they might be there not for the HIV, but um, for something else, okay? Um, you want to monitor for infection. So listen to lung sounds. Make sure they're not getting pneumonia. Take their temperature. Um, count their respirations. Um, monitor their neurostatus. Skin integrity. Make sure they don't have any rashes, bruises, etc. Um, you want to, I told you about alternating periods of rest with activity. Patients should be on daily weights. You want to monitor their nutritional status and I and O. Okay. Now your client teaching, very important. You have to teach them medication compliance because they'll be on a lot of different medications. Um, they need to take their temperature daily. And that's to, you know, it's much better to um, be able to identify a infection coming on or sepsis coming on. Report symptoms of infection to their provider right away. They should use antimicrobial cleanser to wash the axilla and genitals twice a day. Bathe using antimicrobial soap, okay? Um, no fresh flowers and plants. Remember that from the cancer lecture. No standing water greater than an hour. You have to throw it out. Wash dishes in hot water. Wash hands frequently. They cannot eat raw or undercooked food. And do not let them handle kitty litter. Stay away from sick people. Avoid crowds and um, encourage them to engage in medication compliance. Now, I have, just have a couple pictures here I wanted to show you. This is Kaposi sarcoma. See all these like little red and purple lesions? Okay, so that's somebody has Kaposi sarcoma. And this is wasting syndrome. Okay, so wasting syndrome, remember that's unintentional weight loss, diarrhea, anorexia, um, nausea, vomiting, etc. All right, that does it for HIV.